Hello, welcome to this video. On this video, I'm going to be going through my 10 guilty pleasures ranked. And um, by guilty pleasures, I, I don't mean anything non-musical. So, you know, it's, it's not going to be that interesting. So these are, these are um, guilty pleasures musically. This is um, bands or artists that I absolutely love, uh, which um, may be a little bit cheesy, perhaps, or not that cool or whatever. You know, the sort of thing you don't want to admit to, like, you don't want a guilty pleasure. Why am I explaining to people of your age what a guilty pleasure is? You know what one is. So, I'm going to get straight in, I think. Um, no, I'm not. I'm going to tell you what I'm doing. I Because you lot like um, top 10 ranking videos so much, I thought, I'm going to hammer. Let, let's just... Because I always have to have a theme, right? You know, I always have, I always have some idea that I'm doing at that time. You know, I might do videos on jazz, and I might do videos on prog, and then might be political, I might do some comedy videos. I thought, let's just hammer top tens. How how um, how abstract and weird can we get with the top tens? So you're going to see a lot of top tens coming out over the next few days. And this will be the first one, my top ten guilty pleasures ranked, okay? So at number ten, I have the Muppets. Now, I hate the Muppets. When I was a kid, I hated the Muppets. I was more of a Pipkin sort of person. In the in the UK, we had the equivalent of Sesame Street. It was called Pipkins, and all the puppets looked well. They looked at, they looked a bit like they got mange. That 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 was basically the British take on Sesame Street. Was was Sesame Street, but with mange. And uh, if you don't know what mange is, then look it up. But uh, and then go and look up. A, if you're an American, you can go up, look up Pipkins, and you can see Hartley hair, and you go, "Oh God, yeah, he does look like he's got mange." And you realise I'm not just talking rubbish. I've got it completely accurate. I never liked the Muppets that much, but I love the music on the Muppets. The Muppets would have Buddy Rich on. Dad, I think I think they've got Buddy Rich on the Muppets today. Oh, and I'd sit down to watch Buddy Rich or Stefan Grappelli. I can remember they had Stefan Grappelli. And they dressed, dressed him up as a gypsy and put him on a gypsy caravan playing his violin. I mean, you never saw that normally when you saw Stefan Grappelli doing stuff like that, you know. So I, I became a fan of the musical bits of the Muppets, which I think were absolutely brilliant. And so um, I went out and bought um, the Muppets album, which looks like this. And the follow-up the Muppets 2 album. And I love these albums. It's just chock full of brilliant music. Right, so, of course, we've got the one that goes like this. Forget your bloody I love Supremes. Or your bark on Mozart, right? The greatest instrumental tune ever written is, of course, it's a jazz tune. It's got question and answer in. And if you watch it, once you get past that bit, there is an improvised avant-garde vocal scat. I mean, this is heavyweight stuff, and they do stuff that, that is that like that. And it's, it's entertaining, it's funny. But then Kermit the Frog, he's got this little, he's got his little nephew, Asadine, you know, the little cute one. And he sings a tune called Halfway Up the Stair. And there's a video for it, Halfway Up the Stair. And oh, halfway up the stair is the stair where I sit. And then I can't remember, I wish I could. Because uh, I know I can sing it beautifully for you. Because even my awful rendition, I sh it's a good job I don't actually. Because even if I sang it awfully, this song will will bring you to tears every time you listen to it. It brings me to tears every time I listen to it. And it's not even a sad song. It's just a little frog describing the 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 the, which, the, the, the special um, the special um, step on his stairs that he sits. It's not too. It's not at the top. It's not at the bottom. It's just right. And it, and, it, and it promotes this love and beauty, and it's just one of the great songs. Now, I could go through all, all, the, um, all the incredible songs that you will find on the Muppets albums. They are absolutely brilliant, brilliant playing, all sorts of influences there. It's absolutely wonderful stuff. So now you understand what this video is about. I'm going through some music I couldn't talk about. And uh, I've got all these albums. My original intention was to actually pull all the albums out and go, see, I actually own these albums. But um, 
I couldn't be asked finding them. So uh, let's move on to number nine, right? Number nine, I'm going to discuss uh, a giant of British music uh, that had influence on um, rock music that, you know, opened up avenues with the Beatles, the Kinks, and you could still hear his influence even in modern British hip-hop. And it is, of course, the great George Formby. I grew up with George Formby, and I am not the only person that loves George Formby. I believe that George Harrison, the guitarist of the Beatles, was the head of the George Formby Appreciation Society, or was it the Lauren Hardy one, Sons of the Dead? I can't remember now. I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm saying things like they're facts, but I haven't checked them out. Anyway, the fact is the Beatles did like George Formby, and you could hear the influence in the music. George Formby um, was emblematic of the British Northern working class. He also embodied that idea of the trip to the seaside and he was a cheap, cheeky chappy singing popular catchy songs that um, had a touch of the double entendre in there. They were slightly risque all the time. Um, now, Formby, um, everyone thought he was one of them. This was brilliant. Not like one of them, you know. One, oh, God, what are you doing, Andy? Um, not... <laughs> Forget I said that. Um, well, why one of them? See, in 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 um in a in the UK, one of them is a sort of colloquial term for a homosexual. Which, of course, if George Formby was a homosexual, which he wasn't, he was he wasn't happily married. He was he uh, he was married to quite a battle axe, to be truth. But but if he if he if he was homosexual, this wouldn't be an issue at all. I just didn't want you to get confused. The British people when they said he was one of them, and you go, oh, I didn't know he was one of them. No, he's not one of them. That he was working class. Now, he actually wasn't working class. He was actually the son of George Formby Sr., who was a music hall entertainer. He was born into, um, in, into the entertainment world. But he was born deaf, I think. <laughs> There's a lot of facts here I'm chotting out. So I think that George Formby was born deaf. And he cured his deafness when he was about the age of seven, when he had a sneezing fit. That doesn't sound like it's real, Andy. Are you sure you're not dreaming these facts today? Anyway, um, and he emerged on the sort of music hall scene. He had a little ukulele in his hand. As he sang about, he's always got his little ukulele in his hand. And he wrote these all these incredible songs. Now, he then went into film and he made some of the best British films ever made. And George Forby, the cheeky chappy, he would go off and race in the TT races. He would go off to, um, you know... Germany in the war, and he sought Hitler out. He, he was a really great guy. And as he got older, um, you know, he's a national treasure. But I think, uh, you know, I, he did have, have this wife that was a bit controlling. And he, he actually died relatively young, I think around about 61 years old. Bloody hell, I'm pulling a lot of information about George Formby without any, um, any, any sort of research here. But I've tried my best anyway. George Formby, when I go swimming with the women. I'll tell you what I can do, just to finish this off. If I get one of my guitars, I'll go over here and get one of my guitars. Right, look, you can see the walk I just did then. Did you see the musical walk I did? Did you see it? That's because I'm talking about George. You wouldn't see that walk normally. Right, this is a guitar. But the guitar is tuned exactly the same as a ukulele. Now, the reason I can play the guitar was because when I was very, very young, we had a ukulele and my dad would sing George Formby songs. And he said you could sing any George Formby songs with these four chords. And he showed me them. The first one was this. The next one was this. And so I picked up a ukulele and went... I live in... I can't, can't do it. You see, there's no point in trying to do it. You can't do it, you know. I started off all right, but then I realised it was going to be harder. And then my dad said, once you get... Once you get those chords down, if you want to go out into sort of the jazz realms of George Formby, he said, you play this chord. And those are the first chords I learned. Right, and they're still there to this day. I'll do one of the old musical walks again back. Go 
God, I'm providing entertainment today, I am. I am providing so much entertainment. Stand up. That's going to fall over at some point, isn't it? Right. Here's my coffee. I was down here because I'm bloody freezing today. George Formby at number nine. At number eight, this is actually quite a cool band now. I've put them on, but uh, you probably don't expect me to absolutely love them. It's a girl band. It's the greatest girl band of all time. That's no, it's probably Dionysus of the Supremes, isn't it? Or something like that, you know, or maybe LaBelle with Patti LaBelle. But they're good. Anyway, um, in the early 90s, there emerged a girl band called En Vogue, right? And uh, they came out with this song and it was called You're Never Gonna Get It. Oh, you're never going to 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 get it. It was basically that. And I loved it. So I went and bought the album. And uh, these girls, or ladies, or women, they're probably old ladies now, um, they could really sing. And in the middle of this, it was, they had this vocal breakdown. It went... Never gonna get it, 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 never gonna get it. And they did all this. Well, it was all like it was like the Beverly Sisters or something. I thought they were fantastic. And then they they um brought out like a rock song. Was it Free Your Mind? Free Your Mind. Uh, the rest will follow. Well, that's a Parliament Funkadelic. See, I didn't know that at the time. Be clever, blind, and don't. Oh, absolutely brilliant. So there's a, there's a lot of mimicry going on, because I know you guys won't know this stuff. If I start talking about Jethro Tull or the Mavish Dogs, you know exactly where we are, but I bet there's not many of you who like on Vogue out there. Well, I do. I think they're absolutely bloody brilliant. That's what a girls' band should be, like four-part harmonies. I mean, Destiny's Child, they were like that. Absolutely incredible. But I think on Vogue, just they just... That first album, which I can't remember the name of, but I bought... Absolutely brilliant. Right. At, um, these should be higher up on the list. Why have you put them down here? And number seven, I have got the British early 80s ska pop band Madness. Now, um, I love Madness so much, and I keep saying I don't cover them on my channel. This is now, I think, the fourth time I've covered Madness on this channel. Um, and I don't want to go in about how great they are, but they are absolutely amazing. And what strikes me about this band that's always, always dumbfounded me is what you've got here is a large band. It's a large band full of basically, um, what's the word? Juvenile delinquents from London from the late 70s. You know, basically small time criminals that decide to form a band because they like Scar in the wake of punk, Right. So these guys aren't classically trained musicians, not virtuosos. And yet, when I listen to the songs of Madness, for me, the orchestrations and compositions and the themes, and it's just so heavyweight. It's heavyweight. You know, go and listen to I Like Driving In My Car, right? It's like Music Concrete. They've basically created... The, and, and, and when you hear all that clattering, and God knows how they've done it, it's not sampling. They've got into the studio and got loads of bits of metal and banged them all, cut bits of car horns. And But they made that into a so, sort of coherent harmonic bass. Bit of that cockney piano. Ding, ding, comes down chromatic. Ding, 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 ding. And then he comes in. Guy like driving in my car. It's not quite a Jaguar. I boot footballed it from Primsoville. <laughs> Former bloke, I remember the rest of it, and that would have been a funny line. Brilliant lyrics, comedy. Comedy's hard to do. Comedy is hard to do. Horror, if, you, if you're making a film, horror's hard to do because you've got to scare people. You know, most other art forms are just pretentious. They can do whatever they want. You can do any old crap. But horror's hard to do. Comedy's hard to do. Comedy is hard to do. And I think I've always, always appreciated comedy and music. I think like, this is why I love Frank Zappa. And I, so far, of these first four, three of them have been sort of comedic, as is who I've got at number six, which is Chaz and Dave. Now, Chaz and Dave, for me, uh, are like the... They're the antithesis to progressive rock. 
Chaz and Dave come out of the 1960s scene. They're session musicians. They're very, very good players. They're involved in all that psychedelic stuff and funky stuff and soul and R&B and all that. You know, and um, they, um, as I've, as I've uh, explained on, on this uh, video, on the whole video where I explained that, you know, in the early 70s, um, Chaz Hodgetts turned up to a, a session for La Bicifri and laid down the riff that was then taken by Eminem for My Name Is Bomb. My Name Is Bomb. My Name Is Bomb. That's, that's basically Chaz Hodgetts from Chaz and Dave. I think it's actually both of them. It could be all of Chaz and Dave. And uh, the reason is, is because Chaz and Dave actually come out of American rhythm and blues. They come out of uh, Jerry Lewis. They come out of bits of, you know, um, sort of maybe uh, some of the Boogie Woogie, Fats Waller stuff, Fats Domino. They're mainly people call Fats. Um, they, that's, that's where Chaz and Dave come from. And they come up in the scene when everybody around them in East London is drawing... Uh, from American, you know, popular music forms. And then they start to realise, how do we make our way? So what Chas and Dave do, do, which is an absolute work of genius, is they take the sort of sound of Fats Domino and um, Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lee Lewis. So you're talking about Jerry Lewis, Jerry Lee Lewis. Oh, you know, I met that before. Um, and they, uh, they, they fuse that with a sort of Cockney um, music hall style of music. Now, if you listen to the music of Chaz and Dave, it grooves, it rocks. But that's all boogie wiggle. I don't know any of the lyrics, you know. Um, and they do some incredible things like in their tune Rabbits, when they do a sort of gentle giant rabbit, 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 rabbit. Now, that's all brilliant, isn't it? It's all brilliant. Um, their songs are very strong, very, very strong songs indeed. Their songwriting is very good. They're very good musicians. And I think Chaz and Dave are absolutely wonderful. And I do own the best of Chaz and Dave. Right, let's move on now. And I feel a bit mean putting on these because this is a hell of a heavyweight band, really. But uh, I think to this sort of laissez-faire general, laissez general, general public, if I mentioned this band, they would put them in the cheese bracket. I don't at all. At number five, we've got Manhattan Transfer, right? So... When I was a kid, um, Manhattan Transfer emerged when I was quite young. And they came out with this song, which was like a sort of French pastis called Chanson de Mort. You know that one? It was sort of like sort of Chaz de Mort pastiche. And then um, they then followed that up with another hit single, which was quite, I think it was called Walk in Love. And it was like a slushy, Walk in Love. And my dad liked these two tunes. So we went out and bought that album, which I think was called Pastiche, actually. Now I understand why it was called Pastiche. I didn't understand it when I was a young, younger man. But I think doing these videos, you go back to when you're young, suddenly he's, oh, yeah, that's, that's why they called it Pastiche, because it was a Pastiche. Oh, yeah, I understand it now. And, uh, and my dad would play this album over and over again. And I used to get a little bit embarrassed by Walking Love because the lady sang this quite a seductive way. And at one moment she says, we took our clothes off. And I'm thinking, what are they up to taking their clothes off these people in this thing? What are they going off? What, what sort of people are these going off around in the nudge, you know? So um, I was always quite embarrassed about it. And then I started learning the drums and... Uh, well, you know, back in the early 80s when I started to learn the drums, I got what was on the telly, what was on the radio, and then my record collection, which back then was probably about 12 albums. And so to learn more about the drums, I would go rifling through my dad's record collection. And at some point, I pulled out uh, the, the Manhattan Transfer album. And I'm like, oh, my God. And there was this guy called Dave Howells at my school. I met him the other day in the, uh, in, in, in the local spa, and I went up and said, Dave, you were like a hero to me. He was, he was older than me and he was a proper drummer. And he went on to become a professional drummer. Uh, and he's a lovely guy, great drummer. And he was a proper drummer, could read music and everything. So he was a big inspiration to me. And um, I've forgotten why I was talking about <laughs> Yeah. And I remember at school one day, I was chatting to Dave and he goes, have you heard Steve Gadd? I went, no. And I pulled out this uh, Manhattan Transfer album and I think Steve Gadd was on it. So I went, oh, that's the bloke he was talking about. So I put it on. And it opens up with a, a track called The Four Brothers, which is actually a Woody Herman tune, and it's all big band. And Manhattan Transfer are singing um, 
So uh, that's all right. I had my message coming from my daughter. I just want to make sure she was all right. Um, so um, it is like a date with their vocals mimic um, the sound of the big band. All right. London centric arse mongrels who wouldn't know a hedge if it jumped up and bit them on the bum. And they do everything with their vocals. And the playing was incredible. And I would put this on, you know, at the time I'm trying to learn my ACDC things and a bit of Rainbow, and then put this Manhattan Transfer album on, and it was hard to play. And I thought, God, I don't really expect this to be hard to play. And then my dad also then got, went and got the live album, and then he went and bought an album called Extensions, right? Now, Extensions, they did vocal versions of Birdland by Weather Report. They got Sporogyro's tune on there. There was big band stuff. There was a halftime shuffle, uh, but um, sort of, you know, almost like a... Um, uh, uh, Jeff Picaro. Jeff Picaro was on it, but he wasn't actually doing the halftime. Halftime Shovel was actually played on uh, Nothing You Can Do About It. Great song uh, by the great Ralph Humphrey, which, you know, the late great Ralph Humphrey that I managed to do his final interview for before he died. Um, and he, I got to ask him about this and, and send back the fact that I learnt a halftime shuffle. If you're a drummer, you learn to drum when you learn a halftime shuffle. That's when you really learn to drum. That's half time shuffle. I got that from Manhattan Transit. Extensions is a killer album. These are proper, proper jazz musicians, and it was my early, one of my early intros that sort of took me towards jazz fusion. So that's who I've got at number five is Manhattan Transfer. At number four, I've got um, a band that I don't know much about. Um, and I did research, but I can't remember any of it, and I'll gloss over it quick, but I absolutely love this album. It's an album, album called A Cappella. And on this album, these four singers do the most incredible, beautiful a cappella versions of songs by Joni Mitchell and all that type of thing. Now, I think um, this group had actually grown out of an, um, um, an, another group that was around before. And I want to say the Michael Soames singers, but I might be wrong. I'm dragging that up from probably the deepest place I've ever dragged up in any information from. You know why I do these videos. I'm just trying, you know, I try to just come on and talk. So, you know, I'm just a bloke talking and I haven't sat there and just read it all off Wikipedia. So, um... <laughs> This is a fantastic album, uh, recorded in, I think, early 70s. It's got that warm, you know, to tape sound. They're, they're singing it live. The intonation is absolutely perfect. I love the sound of vocal harmonies. I love the sound of vocals. I think this is why I like Manhattan Transfer. This is why I like En Vogue. And a lot of my guilty pleasures are around that type of sweet vocal sound. And uh, this is absolutely wonderful. It's quite, probably the least well-known one on this list. And so um, if... If you like the stuff I like, it's, I recommend it now. And I'm sure there's going to be people here that will say, oh, that album's brilliant, because I think this was an American band and they may have been bigger in America than they were here in the UK. I actually picked up the al this album in a second-hand sort of uh, store um, and uh, I didn't know anything about it and I just thought, well, that's, that looks good and I thought I might get some samples of it and uh, it's just become one of my favourite albums. So I'm going to move on. Right, at number three, three, I have got Barbara Streisand. It was Barbara Streisand. I never know how you say it. Is it Barbara Streisand or Stra Bar Barbara Streisand? Um, it's spelt Barbara Streisand, isn't it? Barbara Streisand. That doesn't sound right. Now, I own an album. I have it. I've had, had it for years. I may have, again, inherited it off my dad. And, uh, and, and it's another one of these albums that I've had from day one. And I sort of grew up listening to it, and I absolutely love it. And it's the album, The Way We Were. Barbara Streisand's got an incredible voice. It's very emotive. She pulls from a tradition which isn't just coming out of sort of black um, American R&B, you know, which uh, I find very interesting. Another singer I absolutely love that I would put into the same bracket would be Judy Garland. There's, there's a commitment to the storytelling in the show. Now, I'm not a big fan of musical theatre. I think the, the, the way musical theatre sing, singers sing today, where it's all diction and precise and the way they emote is awful. Barbara Streisand's an absolute monster and there's so much feeling in there. And then when you get to here, where she's at the sort of height of her powers, 
writing with incredible pop songs. I mean, The Way We Were is such a beautiful song, backed up with some of the best musicians and producers in the world, with the biggest budgets in the world. And those 70s albums are absolutely incredible. They sound absolutely amazing to me. I could just sit back and there's something... There is something so traditional and conservative and yet beautiful in music like this. And I think if you are interested in the avant-garde and you want to go down that route, you have to have some place to start from. And for me, it would be The Way We Were from by Barbara Streisand. That's my starting point for music almost. Go, right, that's music. That is good quality, straight down the line music, right? There we go. It doesn't offend anybody. It's really well done. It's emotive. It's got big themes, you know, but all that sort of stuff. Now, let's move from there. Then, you know, we'll get to Napalm Death later on. So, at number two, I have the Acid Jazz band Jamaraquai, who seems to be uh, the, the butt of many jokes of much ire. Jamaraquai does. I absolutely love them. I think I've got all the albums up until around about, I'd say, 2002. I can't remember the name of the album. They start getting a bit disco-fied. Uh, but that run of albums from Emergency on Planet Earth and then Return of the Space Cowboy and then uh, all the ones that follow the big one with Cosmic Girl on it. What was that called? Um, something about the environment, wasn't it? You know, um, you're not very well-researched for this one, Andy. I, well, come on, you get through it. You'll get through it. <coughs> so, but Jamara quite absolutely love them. They're funky. They're deep. They've got great players in the band, but they've also got great songs and hooks. JK is an incredible performer, a great singer, a great dancer, a great um, mover. Uh, and you feel like he's a proper bloke, don't you? You know, he's out there in his Ferrari. So the other day, they, they cropped up on some, in somewhere and he got this huge big Ferrari, you know. And uh, he, he, he was walking around. He's got grey hair now and he's, he still looks cool. It's a bit chunky, but he still looks cool. Like me, you know, like me. So he's probably the same age as me. You know, a bit, bit grey and chunky, but, you know, still, still a charismatic and handsome man, I would say. Oh, he's a bit too close together. My, mine are as well. That's a I mean, Maybe that's why I like him. Maybe that's why, why I don't like it when people criticise him. I tell him I don't like it when people criticise JK. It's because people that can go out stage, on stage with a great big hat and move and dance around like that and sing those songs and improvise and have a band going, you know, and all that stuff that they do, that's bloody hard to do, Right? And there's a million bands that just stand there looking at the floor, strumming their open chords and thinking they're cool because they're doing that type of stuff. And it, they get championed. Then when somebody comes out and does something like this, right? and when the acid jazz thing was happening in the late 80s, it was cutting edge. I remember when Jamaraquai um, were cutting edge. I bought um, the first record. Well, no, well, the first record I heard, which was called... Uh, um, Oh, come on, Andy, something about a didgeridoo. I think it's called Didgeridoo or Didgeridoo, something like that. It came out on Acid Jazz Records. And then they signed to Sony and they came out with um, Too Young to Die. And I rushed and got that. I was a Jamaicai fan. And then it went in the charts. I was like, oh, wow, there's an Acid Jazz band getting in the charts. Because I was fa fans of Mother Earth and Corduroy and all those bands, you see. So I was right there at the start. And I thought they were a cool band, you know. And then their first album came out and blew everybody away. And then the Return of Space came out came out and they 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 amped it all up that is really close to being heavy fusion jamaicois just don't knock them right so we've got to number one you want to know what number one is number one on my list is one of the most incredible singers in the 20th century one of the most beautiful ladies of the 20th century and a great actress as well one of the major talents and it is of course the great doris day doris day is heavyweight Doris Day is a jazz singer, right? She made an album um, where she sung jazz standards with Andre Previn playing piano. It's some of the heaviest jazz singing. She kicks, she's got soul, she's got the phrasing, right? She's got all the blues. She's a heavyweight jazz singer. And that's where she started in the late 40s, singing with big bands. A, a, a beautiful woman who then was taken up by Hollywood and because she was so talented, could pull all sorts of things off. And she eventually um, develops this squeaky clean uh, sort of image, you know. Um, now... For somebody that's come through the jazz thing to then get the gig doing Calamity Jane. And Calamity Jane is such an incredible film and all those brilliant songs and the way she performs is absolutely amazing. And it's so far from that 
but if you track her films through, you know, she's, she works for Hitchcock and pulls it off. So as a, as a talent, as a completely, she was something else. But go back to the scene songs, you know, get past K. Sarah, Sarah, which is great, but start to get to some of those incredible tunes she's got. Um, I have the best of Doris Day. It's on CD and it never leaves my car. I absolutely love her voice. I love Sarah Vaughan. I love Ella Fitzgerald. I love Billie Holiday. And I love Doris Day. Right, she's slightly cleaner than those singers. You know, a little bit more, I suppose you could say white, but I don't want to, but that's the maybe the only way I could get that across. But it's still... 100% jazz. She could sing jazz properly. Listen to her. Listen to the way she bends the melody. Doris Day, and she, what did she live to? 97 years old. You know, there was she was an old lady. You know, with her with her dogs and all that sort of stuff. And uh, did her son then get involved in music and was part of the Manson clan or something? And then oh, I don't know something like that. So the, so she's got all that going on around her and stuff. But uh, Doris Day is a real deal. Doris Day is the real deal. She was a heavyweight. Many of these are heavyweights. That has been my ten guilty pleasures so i hope you enjoyed it and uh, if you did put a like on this video if you want to see more subscribe right now press the button subscribe if you want to become a patron i have a patron the link is down below you can become a free member or a paid member and if you want to give me a tip there is a paypal tip jar down below thank you for watching i will see you on the next video